Do not hit other board members. That's right. Good evening. We'll call this meeting of the Lambertsville Unified School District Board of Education to order for January 21st. At this time, if everyone in the audience would please silence their cell phones. And for the board, a uh, reminder, this is being recorded. Please utilize your microphones. Make sure they're on. And at this time, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call. Matthew Balzarini. Here. Colin Clements. Here. Sharon Lampell. Here. Shane Nielsen. Here. David Pombo. Here. Tessa Pumchai. Here. Uh, approval and or corrections the agenda. There are none. I move we approve the agenda. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, receiving a public comment. <coughs> Anyone has anything from the public they'd like to discuss or comment on that's not on the agenda? Hearing none. Uh, consent items for consideration. We have quite a few. Uh, there's approval of a governing board me meeting minutes from January 7th, the budget revisions and warrants, approval of five hires, uh, acceptance of four resignations, acceptance of a $500 donation towards the CSBA board workshops, Brown Act training, and the Institute for new uh, board members from Scott Carlson, and also the acceptance of grant award from Sutter Tracy Community Hospital and the Tracy Hospital Foundation, the amount of $10,000 for the LUSD wellness program. Any board member like to remove any of these for discussion? I have some comments, some minor corrections, but we can wait until there's a motion. I move we approve the consent items. Second. Discussion. Yes, on, uh, in the minutes, in section 6C, there's a typo, the fifth line. The C is missing in the word difference. You see that? This is really, oh there, that's better. One, two, three, four, five. She wanted to distinguish the difference between a vacancy or leave. One, two, three, four, five. Nobody see that but me? You got it? Okay. It. <laughs> okay. Got it. okay. Just assumed you were right. Oh. <laughs> I wasn't going to go. Oh, Colin. <laughs> okay. And in uh, section 11A3, I can find it here. 11A3. Um, English, there's a typo. I think it's supposed to be English. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, old English spelling. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Um, that's it. I only had I had one comment on the minutes Wait, in section ten, sub point B, which is um, page two of the packet, page four of the PDF. Um, I believe it was me that requested the change to. Um, tobacco use rather than smoking. And it says Trustee Lampel. I don't know if that matters. Okay. Change it to Trustee Clemens. Um, for me, less of a correction and more of just a general comment to thank and congratulate the people who worked to uh, obtain that grant from. Uh, uh, Sutter Tracy, that's no small chunk of change. It was no small amount of work I'm aware of. So um, it takes a great amount of time and effort on several people's parts to do that. I know one in particular. So I just, in general, wanted to thank the staff for their hard work to obtain that grant. I agree. Thank you. Absolutely. And I can say that the staff lead on that was Dr. Gill. So uh, she's three years in a row has delivered a larger amount. So we do appreciate the efforts. Any further discussion? Okay, we have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. District administrative reports. Item A, superintendent's report. I'd like to uh, introduce uh, or bring up to the uh, the uh, 
podium um, Sudhir Mata and Padu Balamini uh, to do a final presentation on uh, what is now called the Lammersville Unified uh, Communication App. Uh, we want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Mata and his uh, company Cisco for funding the uh, project. And uh, we've made the final revisions. Um, we have done a test launch with students and parents at the high school. And we twofold, he wants to show the updates that have been made to the uh, to the app. And also uh, there's an action item about using the fundraising mechanism and, and bringing that forward um, this evening as well. Thank you. Um, thank you once again for giving Entapia an opportunity to show what we have done uh, in our app. Um, from last time, we have added, um, again, last time we did start adding more schools to the app, but this time it's now available uh, in the app store uh, with all the schools. So you can see in the presentation that you can change to a school. Um, every school is right now on the app. So you can just do change schools and all the information will come from that particular school. Um, in addition to that, we have added more information into the uh, app. We also uh, figured out a way to sync with the new website, the shop school space website, uh, automatically onto the app, so no extra effort needed to bring information or content from that into the app. Okay. Um, so, uh, but with all, meaning b before I go to that, um, the reason that we wanted to be here is to show the new fundraising feature that we have added to the app itself. Um, I'll demonstrate that right here uh, on what we are trying to do. Um, again, um, fundraising is something that is essential for school districts, uh, and we want to make that simple for all the schools, the parents, um, to raise funds for the school. So the app, you can download uh, from the App Store, and once you download, there is a link called fundraising here. You just need to click on that. And we have worked with uh, close to 250 retailers and brought them here onto the app. Um, you can see a list of uh, stores here. So for example, Best Buy, Target, Amazon. So a uh, lot, lot of uh, interesting uh, retailers on board. And anything that you want to purchase, for example, if you want to purchase on Amazon, all you need to do is just click on from here, go to Amazon, and do your normal transaction. So you can buy a book, you can buy anything that you want on Amazon, and a portion of it comes to the school directly. So this is something now live. So we have established relationship with more than 250 retailers, and they are all onboarded here. Now I want to set up a set of um, rules, right? Um, different retailers behave differently, or at least set up conditions differently. For example, if you buy <coughs> a gift card from Amazon, you get a up to three percentage easily uh, from from the Amazon to the school. But if you buy a gift card in Target, you get zero dollars. Um, so different retailers have set up different rules for different products. You buy an apparel, apparel from Target, you get easily 3% for all of those things. But you buy Apple's product from Target, you get zero. So what we have done is over the last few weeks, we have analyzed each of those vendor contracts and tried to bring up that information. And we are trying to put that on the website itself so that a parent buys something that is not something participated by the retailer, uh, you may directly go and buy it, right? Um, so this is something that we are putting a lot of effort. Um, this is again, all of this is in addition to the app itself that brings out all the information about the school uh, onto the app. And in, ad added, in addition to that, we have brought this fundraising piece into that. Now, this is not just in the app alone, but it's also there on the web. I'll just show you the example of that. Um, and probably while you're doing that, very quickly, <laughs> let me add. So today, fundraising requires parents to Either we are guilting kids to sell cookies and all that kind of stuff, or parents have to put out money from their own pockets. The idea of this is that all transactions that I am incurring during my natural everyday process, if I go through the app, that benefits the school. And that's, that's the primary goal, is with no new net outlay from the parents, if we can tap into the local economy and get money to the schools, there's a lot of benefit. This has been a, a proven method in a lot of places. Uh, it's good that we've been able to bring it into the school district app so that the same app does all of this. So that's where I think there is uh, real value. It will take a lot of hard work, very candidly, for us to change our behavior, to go into an app or a website, to be able to open and click and blah, blah, blah. 
But as we start to see funds flow in, I think we'll start to encourage behavior per, by the student uh, school foundations. We can start to have impact. So in a very small test run, we've had some really good impact. But now we want to go to the high school and, and maybe the other schools. Uh, so this is a, a very interesting, innovative model. So uh, we're hoping this will uh, work very well. This is the site, again, we will publish that. To, uh, this is for each school. For example, this is customized to the high school. It has the mountain house high school use there. And again, the same behavior. I just have to go and click on a shop here and then continue my shopping um, right there. So, and then the portion of it will come to the school. Um, what I just also want to tell the behavior. So what happens is that you do a shopping, um, you get that shipped to your house. Now, if you return it or if you have some issues with the product, we, meaning as Kentapia, we have no idea of what you have bought, when you have bought. Okay, what we know is that at the end of the month, the individual retailers tell us that this is the amount that people have bought from you. So we don't have insights on your pattern, but we do get information that this is the total amount of money that um, the schools have bought from your site. Um, and we do give the money back tabulated per school uh, so you will get to know individual schools how much they are contributed towards the general pool. And parents also have a choice to not choose any school, just directly go to the school district. So we give all that information when we give the money back. The money itself is placed in a sort of a escrow that we um, manage that. And uh, every 60 days or so, we give that money uh, as a check to the school district. So it's, it's simple to use app or website, um, parents just have to use it. Um, so just to give an example, right? If you spend $100 on this website um, there, and on the proper products, the schools get 2 to $3 or 1 to $3 depending upon the product. Now every parent here use that um, $100 they spend through this one, you can see that every parent gives to the school 2 to $3 a month and that adds up to the school district uh, quite you have around 2,000 school um, parents uh, or households here, and if they spend uh, $2 every month, that adds up for the school district. So that's, that's our model, um, uh, and, and I do, do want to add that we do take a nominal amount out of that particular money, and after that is what you get one to three percentage. Um, so again, school, this is something we are Meaning this is not a new model that has been tried. This has been tried everywhere. But what we want, what we want to do is that not just ask parents to just go to the website and buy, but also use the app to get the full use of the, uh, meaning to get the communication to work with the school, right? So that's our goal. So the app plus the fundraising as a whole uh, brings more value to the school district. So that's that's our uh, any and quick questions? question um, on the. Uh, the very first page, it's optional to put your email in. So what comes up in the emails? <clears throat> so we are, so again, so there is there is a possibility that we could track at individual parent level. Um, so for example, you can right now, if you do a, a cookie, um, scouts sell cookies, right? And they do have a sort of a game that which kids sell more uh, cookie, right? Now, Theoretically, right now we do not do, but if you put an email which is the same as a registered user um, or a parent, we can say that this, are the, this, is, this parent raised this much money. Now this is something that we can discuss about, but you can have a sort of a race or some sort of a behavior where we can say that top three parents in your school, right? We do not know what they bought, but we can track to a level that this is the amount that they have helped generate for the school district. One of the purposes of that is Longer term, it would be fun to have a race in a, uh, between two classes to say this parent has chosen this grade in this school. And so you know, one teacher, if, if they're having fun with it, their, their parents are okay, can, can actually see it at that level. Today, it's at the school level, but that gives granularity on uh, how much that particular email address spent, not what they spent on. Right, so just to clarify so everyone understands, you have no way of tracking what I purchased, but you can track that I earned $3 for Mountain House High School tonight. Correct. Okay. The, uh, the expectation is low that people will ent enter an email because mm -hmm. there's always privacy concerns, so that's why there's no there's an option not the, to. It says optional, yeah. yeah. 
but if they start to, and again, this will be as we take this through the classes, and if it truly catches on and, and teachers start to have some fun with the parents, you know, as they work with their class parents and everything, mm -hmm. it could be something that we can start to have some uh, competition or raffle and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I, I have a couple of questions about the um, <coughs> tracking of the funds. And you mentioned an escrow-like account. Is that a separate account that only money from this program goes in and out of? Um, yes, yeah, so, but it's... Right now, yes, all the school districts, it's not that we have one, one account for Lamasville alone. It's an account that NTAPIA manages, and the retailers put money there. But they also give the tracking that this is the school that made this much money. So we take that, we collect it, and give it back to the school. But So it's commingled with other Correct. schools' monies, but it's not commingled with other monies. No, so this is for... They, an account that we have established with the retailers that they put it in there. And you also mentioned that a nominal fee. What, what is a nominal fee? So <clears throat> the fee is, see, this is something that, um, so this is in addition to the app that we are providing for the school as free, right? So we need to manage that app. We need to support that app. And that app, as we start using, we're going to send more notifications, more email, more uploads, more images, and all of that cost for us to manage, right? Mm -hmm. And that's that, plus of course we need to take a profit, and that's the nominal fee. The nominal fee, again, this is something, it, it, it varies. Some retailers keep changing every other week, right? So when we say one to 3%, we, want, we are averaging that out. Sometimes um, the retailers may not give some money because they have changed or the product became um, more in demand and they reduce the amount of percentage that you give. So, but we want to keep a standard where you have this product. If you have listed a product and you bought it, we want to give one to three percent in that. So we want to average it out. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it uh, goes down. So we want to have a fee that we can manage all of these things in there. And again, nominal fee, I don't have an exact number on that, but you can see um, up to half a percent or up to one percent, depends upon different cases, uh, more than what um, you give you. That would be half to 1% of the total. So if, in Trustee Lampel's <coughs> example of $3, it would be half to 1% of the $3, or half to 1% of the 3%, which off, would? Again, uh, depends. So some retailers, yes, it could be up to half a percent of the whole transaction, but in some cases, we get $3, um, 10 cents, and we keep the 10 cents or 20 cents, and then we give the $3. It, uh, again, this is something that Probably if we can, if I can come back to the next meeting and, and if we try this out, we see also the pattern how the uh, each individual retailer provides us and how we are averaging out. Well, if we have, I can give you more data on this probably in the next uh, in couple of months. Uh, I can come to the board meeting. I can give you the uh, detail in in, a, in so that I, because right now I'm guessing um, I have tried it out with different retailers. I haven't tried with all the 250 retailers. I've tried with 30 or 40 of them, and I'm, I have set up the same relationship with other retailers, but we need to try that out. I can give better data on this one. Okay. I'm, I'm keying back to a comment that, uh, that Matt uh, Balzarini, Balzarini made um, on the discussion that we had several meetings ago about allowing um, the fingerprint ID and the the fact that they're a profit-making venture, letting them use our facility. Um, my question is, it, you know, and he mentioned it's a nominal fee, but it is a profit-making venture. I am not disagreeing with this because I don't know enough yet. I'm simply asking the question: Do we have an obligation to do? You know, can we? You know, can we move forward with this? Um, and I'm just tossing it out there, right? I, is this the same thing, Matt? Or similar. That was kind of a different situation. That was the issue was a gift of public funds, is what the discussion was, and um, which was allowing them to use our facilities is a gift of. We public are a funds. governmental agency, so mm -hmm. we can't right because there's we usually charge for it. If we let in, we use it without charging them. That's a gift of public funds. Okay. The difference here, I believe, is and <laughs> wouldn't it be great that we have counsel here tonight? But uh, um, <laughs> um, the money's going to the company. It, we're the government agency, they're not. I think that's the difference. Okay. 
That's right. what I, I, mean. I do think it's a legitimate question that we might want to get a tiny bit of clarification on. And I'm just one of, considering we're asking all of our fundraising arms to be a little bit more reporting, I'd like to see, or I'd like to at least request it for consensus that we see a regular report on this too. Uh, and not because I'm distrusting the nominal fee. I don't know what it is, but that's the whole point. I don't know what it is. Right. We don't know. So to see regular reports on this on a quarterly or annual basis, I think is going to be something, you know, we're going to need moving forward. So. Absolutely. So, so I just want to add one point. Sorry about that. Um, so this is a not a new model, right? So there are uh, business models um, that does this particular business, and we would like to, meaning it, it's not it's out in the open, right? Meaning what we are trying to do is that take that and bring the app together is what they're value added. Meaning we, the more the school gets successful, we are successful. We are vested right in here, and we want to work with um, the PTAs, the foundation, the principals to make both the app side of it and the fundraising part of it. And, and we will absolutely provide detailed report um, once a quarter or so. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be able to yeah. look, uh, The one thing I would say is I, we don't have anything that has the website part of the address. And, and like you say, it's going to take time for people to change their habits. I guarantee you if I give that website address to my wife, we'll start using that while I try to get to the, the app to be able absolutely. to use it at home. So if we could get that information and get it out there, I think would be a great idea. We have not done a launch yet. We wanted to. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. Sorry. This is this is just uh, this is the slow rollout. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so we we've done a couple of presentations. We had a small number of kids at the high school. We let the, the kids at the high school and their parents kind of test with it starting on Friday. For us, it's the fundraising mechanism. We want to make sure we get that proper approval, and then we'll put together a plan to launch this Perfect. universally across the district at all the school sites. Okay. And my question about the nominal fee wasn't to question it as much as get clarification because nominal is a very subjective term. <laughs> I, yeah, absolutely. So we have uh, calculated the 1% to 3% based on what we have right now. As we go forward, we will certainly explain what needs to be done, increase or decrease. We will talk about that. And like you said, this is not a brand spanking new concept, and I think a good portion of our community will be fam familiar. This seems to work very much like Ebates, and I don't need a check for $1.60. If that $1.60 can go to the schools, that's great. Yes. So I think people are familiar with the way this works. Yes, absolutely. So thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. If we could, Harold, could you speak to that, to uh, Trustee Clement's question? I was on the call. <laughs> well, I'm here. If, if you don't mind, if, if you're in a position to do it. No, I, I, I'm Harold Freeman, by the way, for some of you I've not yet met. I'm glad to actually be here tonight. Yeah, I think there is a distinction, and you make a good distinction. The gift of public funds issue usually comes up when funds are flowing directly from the district to somebody else. If you really are just, you know, perhaps your name's affiliated in the sense kind of on the sidelines, but really this is a transaction where somebody is making a payment and there's a percentage going to a private company bringing it in. I don't think it raises that gift of public funds issues. Now, of course, I have to give the caveat. It's the first I've heard of it tonight, so that's off the top of my head. But of I think you're on the right track with it. Well, Harold, wouldn't it be very similar to any fundraiser where that organization is making money and the school district is getting this little percentage for as our fundraiser? So I right. see that it's very similar. In, in well, retrospect, I think I was overthinking it, actually. <laughs> I think it's a legitimate question. I do, because what you're talking about is if we tell parents we're getting 3%, but we're not, we're getting 2%, I, I just think it's a fair assessment to say this is a, re a reflection of what we're getting so parents truly know. I, I personally don't think most parents are going to go, what? Only 2%? Never mind. Uh, it, it's just to be able right. to be open and honest about it. I think mm -hmm. it's a great question, and I think, again, you know, I, I, I would like to know. I think we all would like to know, and I do want to make sure we're staying above board. No white thing, Harold, for the emergency stuff. Nothing personal. <laughs> no offense taken. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It is? It is. It's on. It's, I think you turned me down. <laughs> <laughs> Anything further? I curse quite a bit. <laughs> okay, item B is a quarterly, rep quarterly report for the William Uniform Complaint. Uh, for October 14th or December 14th? There were no complaints. Um, I did have one brief thing. The uh, date is not checked on the top of the form. Yeah, I was just <laughs> pointing that out to her. <laughs> yeah. Uh, item C is the enrollment and quarterly ADA report. I'm proud to announce that our current net uh, ADA, or I'm sorry, uh, 
enrollment is 3,525 students. That's 25 additional students from the last time we reported. And Alvina will speak to the ADA. That's page 39, I think 37. Mr. Clements has been two pages different. It's actually a very good attendance rate, even for the high school, 98%. That's excellent. Very good percentage. Normally they say to look at 96.6. I was very pleased with that. As you know, with independent study, those are usually very low. Sometimes when the independent study contracts are collected, that they haven't reported in the attendance reports, but um, they tend to be on the lower side. So I did have a question on that when I saw the low percentage, which is pretty common for independent mm -hmm. studies. How are we following up on the independent study work because the completion rates are very low and they're hurting our P1 and P2 reporting for um, ADA? Are we doing anything to track this work down so we can eventually give the credit? For yes, I, I usually try to reach out to the school sites when I see these. I know Wickland was having some transitions in staff, mm -hmm. so we will be making sure to reach out with them to provide them additional support just to make sure that they're entering the information correctly because we can mm. go in there and, and adjust based on what they've rec collected. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, item D is a quarterly cafeteria report. Uh, refer to our CBO. Yes, and Mrs. Hill is in the audience. Um, preparing for Cinerome, I didn't have an opportunity to take a look at November. The food service program had been doing so well for so long that when I saw page um, 42, 43, which would be what, 40, 42, 41, <laughs> on the scanned packet, seeing the difference in the year-to-date totals caught me off guard. So then I went back and started to look in additional details. I do have someone else um, collecting the data. We did switch over to a new program. So we started, Mrs. Hill and I started rummaging through the reports and realized that the a la carte sales from the high school were missing out of the data collection. But then as we continued to look further in the reports, we also realized some of the December bills had not been paid yet. So it was kind of a wash. But after those reports were prepared, I thought I needed to make a note. So then I created that page 41 page 39, the section between the two horizontal lines, the net increases there. Those will need to be adjusted, but the net would still be 36,000, but negative. But I did want to point out the operating days were low three months. August only had eight days. We had to pay a full month's salary out to staff. Same thing for November, same thing for December. It's usually a negative the beginning half. We knew with the high school staff, uh, high school opening, not high school stuff, high school opening, that there may be potential loss there, not knowing how many would be participating. But going through these, I'm pretty confident that we will not face a very large deficit this first year. Uh, Mrs. Hill and I will diligently be working on, on these numbers closer to ensure that there is no contribution from general fund in, in, for food services. I did have one question on this. It looks like the supplies may be on track for going over the budgeted um, operating expense for that. And how is that being addressed? Which or do we have? I didn't write which line. Um, okay. I'm gonna, I believe page 42. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on page 42. And total supplies. <clears throat> um, the approved budget, 397,000 year to date expense, 217. We're about mm -hmm. half the year over. I know she does have some inventory on hand. Um, so it's at 54% already and we haven't hit half of the year. Correct. That was my concern. So I was looking at the percentage of the budget and sometimes different parts of the year, like the, attend like the days worked, by Correct. the end of the year, it evens out. So I was wondering if operating expenses, uh, supplies rather, do tend to be more in the beginning of the year and than And I think later. for the high school, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had $12,000 of one-time costs right off the bat of that 36000 So I'm, I'm not as concerned as I was thinking when we first started. <clears throat> you know, last year preparing budget, I potentially thought at first glance we could hit a deficit of 100000 mm -hmm. I no longer feel that we would hit that kind of deficit this year. And 54% is not that far off for December, where half the year is like right, right. about Right, and now. I'm pleased to say our, our normal trend is 50% of the population participates in the school lunch. And mm -hmm. so when Bernie Hill was sharing those figures that the high school was participating at those similar levels, and that uh, Bethany School was participation was even increasing, that was good news to hear. Yeah. 
That means the food's good. Yes. <laughs> But I'd like to thank her because I know she works very hard and she was terrified when I gave her that phone call when I, when I found this that she immediately came over and we just started scouring through the records. And thank you. Just mm -hmm. to clarify, at least from our, my perspective, this is never about trying to make money anyway. We're just no. trying to try to get, to get this as close to zero as possible to have yes. no impact on the budget. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you ask me $2.50 for a meal, that's not too shabby for yeah. not just getting microwave burritos and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, okay. although I think you can't get those too. The the meal offerings and stuff that we're giving for $2.50 is very reasonable and very healthy options. And I'm, I'm confident we'll get these numbers down. I'm guessing there was a lot of upfront cost worrying about what participation well, was Well, high be. school food service was, high school food services was new to me, and I know it's very new for <clears throat> Mrs. Hill, so I'm proud of her. <laughs> very good, thank you. Uh, governing board reports, Trustee Clements. I will be attending the CSBA training for new board members in the Brown Act um, this weekend. Um, I did attend the Kimball, uh, with uh, Principal Fobert, I attended the um, Kimball High School informational night for seniors um, to make sure that they weren't saying some of the stuff. But they, the, I thought it was a reasonable presentation. And I will be attending tomorrow's informational night for Mountain House High School as well. Um, and uh, as far as the committee report in, I, I did interface with um, Dr. Nicholas on my committees. Um, I got some inform background information, but I have yet to attend a meeting at this point. Thank you. Mine's less of a report and more of just a general comment. I want to personally thank Mr. Faubert for the absolute outreach attempt that you made to get the information out there about both last night's or tomorrow night's meeting and tonight's meeting. Any member of this community had ample opportunity to find out what was going on where and when. And I just want to thank you and your staff for getting that information out there because one, I think it was critical just to go to find out things were there. And two, it's part of a step we're trying to make forward to say, we know you want to hear more things and hear it from us in different ways. And I think that that was a great step forward. So I just wanted to thank you. Okay, I also plan on being at the meeting at Mountain House High School tomorrow night, and I also wanted to let the public know that we received official notification from the San Joaquin County Office of Education that we once again, no surprise, submitted a positive budget. Thank you, Alvina. <laughs> nice job. And that's not just a one-year budget, for those of you that don't know how uh, school district budgets go. That means that the county office said, what we are projecting for the next three years is logical. We have the money to do it, and we're not going to go broke. Very good. Thank you. Um, I, too, will be attending tomorrow night's meeting at, at Mountain House High School with my daughter, who will be a senior at Mountain House High School next year. And I would like to encourage anyone who knows any students who are juniors this year, whether it's at Kimball or any other school for that matter, they're welcome to come to the meeting tomorrow night and hear what Mountain House High School is all about and ask questions. If you're concerned about something, come and ask a question. If they don't know the answer right off the bat, they'll get it for you and ally your concerns. That's my report. Okay, um, today I attend the safety committee meeting, which is currently comprised of uh, staff and uh, chaired by Dr. Gill. And, um, Good meeting. We reviewed our, our uh, drill that we did at Wickland, talked about some upcoming safety issues, and also made the decision as a committee that we want to um, have some parents involved in, in this committee. It's one of the few committees from the district that doesn't have parental, parental involvement, and um, Dr. Gill will be reaching out to try and get some uh, community folks onto the committee. Uh, Saturday, I'll be attending the CSBA president workshop, and... Uh, since everyone's going, I guess I'll go tomorrow night, too. <laughs> not, unfortunately, I have school tomorrow night, so I won't give get a full to report. go. I will, awesome. I'll give you a full report about con law, if you'd like. No? Yes, please. <laughs> um, <clears throat> governing board reports for your committees, the facility use committee. Uh, the agenda for the meeting will be going out tomorrow, and uh, we have a meeting on Monday at 6.30. And just kind of a, a snapshot, I'll tell you that we're going to be appointing two community members to the committee at the board's request. 
I also wanted to add one more thing to my committee report that I forgot is that um, I went to the for the filming for that. Uh, What's going on? Thank you. That's this year. Yes. Okay. And uh, one of the questions that they were trying to drill me down on was goals for this year. And I explained that my goals really don't matter. It's the goals of the board. And I told them and I spoke on behalf of the board and I, I felt confident saying that a goal for this board is communication. So um, that was kind of the theme of my discussion is, you know, we're, we're trying to reach out. And I've seen a lot of communication from the sites, which I really appreciate. The sites are reaching out, uh, finding out better ways to communicate and, and what, how the district can communicate with the public. And it's, uh, everything's going in the right direction. So I'm proud of that. And action items. Item A is considered approval of updated fundraisers for Mountain House High School and a district-wide fundraiser through the Antapia app. I move we approve the updated fundraisers. Oh, I'm sorry. No, please, that was the was best report ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We have a first. Is there a second? I will second, and I, I do have some comments. I think it's in this document. Hold on just a moment. Can we, oh, let's, I'm sorry. Uh, did you have anything to add first, Kirk? No, I, I think uh, the presentation spoke for itself, and we've been updating Mountain House High School's fundraisers, so uh, we're, we're good. Okay, thank you. My apologies. So since this is... This uh, fundraising FAQ, I'm trying to find where I saw. I think in a formal document that comes out of the district, we shouldn't be using the shortened language of app. That's verbal language and everyday language. But in a formal document, we should be using the word application. And I did check into this today. And in formal documents, it should be application, not app. Okay. Not a big deal. I would, I would like to add that um, there's a, a meeting that we've set up uh, for some time in the latter part of this month, a uh, lunch that I have been doing um, with all of the foundation, PTA, boosters, and the like. We have them come in for a lunch and kind of give an update on what's going on in the district. And we've asked the, uh, Padu and Sudhir to come and present this and walk them through it as part of that conversation so that they get a hands-on Q&A with the people that, that helped put this together. So I can't recall what the date is, but we'll have it, have it out um, in the invite. Okay, further discussion? All right, we have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item B, consider approval of adoption of revised administrative regulation 3541.1, transportation for school-related trips. Staff report. So in brief, uh, we have a, 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 board, a board policy and administrative regulation that was uh, unintentionally too restrictive in the circumstance of a parent who wants to deliver their child to and from an event, especially on the weekends and on the evenings. So we uh, sought counsel's advice and they recommended language change uh, that would allow a parent exclusively driving their children um, the freedom to, to work outside of, of the policy um, for the sake of getting people to and from these these events. Move to approve the adoption of revised administrative regulation 3541.1, transportation for school related trips. I'll second. And I just wanted to mention, I don't know, I'm sure Shane, you remember that we had discussion at nauseum and, and I believe, I recall, this was back, I mean, back on the elementary board, so it was a long time ago. The thought behind it was we didn't want to encourage parents to drive their own students, which that was meant for field trips, but I do understand now that this is something that's different. This is kind of more focused, and I get it, but that just was kind of, for those of you that weren't on the board, that was kind of the intent before was we wanted the, we really wanted was to charter buses. That was the most, the mm -hmm. easiest way to do Desert it buses. and not have to deal with the liability and everything mm -hmm. else and insurance and stuff. So. But obviously when we made that policy, this wasn't taken into consideration, so. And if I could add, not to put my not quite legal hat on, I would just say I don't think it's quite restrictive enough because it say may take their own child, but it, it, I do think you want to say only their own child, I, I, just your own child. It's, to me as I read it, it's, it's vague enough that I could do, well, yeah, I'm driving my own child and his friend. I, I, just, the word, I just want to add the word only own child. Only their own child, that's it. 
just to be very specific about it. And that's the intent of it, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Freeman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Trustee Clemens, are you willing to amend your motion? Uh, if no one else agrees, I'm okay. I agree. If council doesn't think it's necessary, I'm really okay too. It's no, just, I know. like your, your idea very much. Yeah. So I that would be a move to adopt revised administrative regulation 3541.1 transportation for school related trips as amended. And I will follow up with another second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Don't be sorry. Well, Item C, consider approval of 2015-2016 budget development calendar. Staff report please. Uh, this is a perfunctory act to approve the calendar for the budget development. I'll move for approval of the 2015-16 uh, budget development calendar. Second. For the discussion? I, I think that there's one, one change on page 60, on page 66, which is 68 of the PDF. The board approve, it says February 4th is the board approval of the 2015-2016 budget development calendar, which I think is what we're doing tonight. That's oh, correct. good point. I thought it was February. <laughs> <laughs> Are you rushing January towards spring break? Spring break. <laughs> <laughs> January's it should be January. <laughs> so we'll make that amendment. So we'll just change that to tonight. You concur? Yes. Change your. I will um, uh, make a motion to approve 2015-16 budget development calendar uh, with the one change of changing uh, February 4th to January 21st, is that today? Mm -hmm. um, for the adoption of the uh, budget development calendar. And I will second all of that. <laughs> First and second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Good catch on that. Uh, information discussion items. Item A is a 2015-16 Mountain House registration for 9th through 12th grades. Is there a staff report on this? Yes. Good evening, P President Balzarini and uh, members of the governing board. Um, I'm just here to um, inform you of um, the steps that Mountain House High has been taking. Um, you've already mentioned some of the communication out to the community that we've done in terms of uh, our program for next year. Um, we're excited to offer a program to all four classes uh, next year as well. Um, we're doing information nights uh, to parents, um, um, of the K-8 schools, of all K-8 schools, uh, beginning February 2nd and uh, running through February 6th, as you can see in your packets. Um, sophomores um, have, are, are being met with, uh, they were met, some were met with today by Mrs. Friesen, our, our uh, guidance counselor. Um, she will finish with sophomores uh, tomorrow explaining um, um, the process uh, for, for next year and the course selection process. Um, and freshmen will, will be happening the 27th and 28th. We have um, informational nights, as you mentioned, coming up tomorrow night uh, for potential seniors. Um, and also um, ninth and 10th grade students, um, um, parent information nights for those parents, um, February 5th. Um, incoming freshmen, February 12th, uh, there will be a, a, uh, an informational night for those parents as well. Um, we've also uh, set up times for eighth through 10th graders, incoming freshmen through incoming juniors, um, windows of time when they will be able to go through and register and select courses. They'll be using ARIES to do that as we've done in the past and um, um, we're, we're still determining a date for potential incoming seniors. So um, we, are, we are building it and we're confident they'll come. Um, <laughs> um, and we're very excited about that. We, uh, I also have a sheet here with um, courses available to incoming seniors, so I'd like to share that with you. And um, on the back there um, is some other information that was uh, shared out at a neighboring school this evening. Just for my own clarification, how confident are we on this list? I mean, I know we have to, there's additions and subtractions based on stuff, but. Thank you. This is what we're hopeful to be able to provide to our students. We, we, are, we are committed to offering this if the numbers allow. Awesome. And 
what you've gone with with this is I'm assuming this is based on the interest that you've seen with the current students this year. Yes, yes. And also just to, you know, to update you on our accreditation process, um, we're on track to receive our WASC accreditation um, early next month. Um, and also our staff has been working on preparing our um, UC A to G uh, outlines. Um, we anticipate once those, once our accreditation from WASC uh, comes in, um, that, that we'll be able to submit those outlines and be accredited for, for, for UC um, credit as well. Are you getting visited by a WASC team? Or we have already been visited, oh, have, okay. yeah. If I could speak to that point, um, the team at the high school needs to get a second round of kudos. Um, typically a, a first WASC visit happens in, at the end of the year, um, but they were proactive and I would say determined uh, and getting uh, the visit. They've already gone through the visit. I can tell you that the, the visitation was very successful. Um, and they're anticipating as early as next week or the following week getting their accreditation. The team that came out to visit were very complimentary of the team, the, the culture of the school, the, the inspiration of their kids, the support of the board. Um, it's one of the most positive WASC experiences that I've had. Typically, they're kind of bureaucratic and boring. Um, why that's important is the A through G approval process, by going fast on WASC, it also allows us to go fast on A through G and allows us to communicate to our parents and kids of, of upperclassmen exactly what their future lies. Um, very, very important. And the final piece is, is uh, Mr. Faubert and I uh, made a phone visit with uh, the University of California, the whole organization, and they have um, earned a reputation for being slow and they have fast-tracked their program and so we got all the ins and outs of how to do that. So the second they accredit, uh, give accreditation to the high school, we can move forward that second piece. And, and according to their person, as long as everything goes the way it's supposed to, we're looking at finishing a very complicated process sometime in March. And that probably wouldn't have happened under normal circumstances without the hard work of team high school. So kudos to them. Just, I, I would like to point out um, the quick facts on the back. Um, we're doing some really exciting things at the high school next year, um, including offering uh, um, uh, courses, Delta College courses uh, at high school, and uh, we're, we're uh, implementing a um, Cisco Network Academy uh, courses as well. So um, there are great things happening. Do the two of you or your counselor ever sleep? <laughs> as much as possible, but we also thank you for your support. Um, I'd also like to say that just looking at these courses, a lot of my friends are like really they're really curious about this, and this, this looks like just what we're looking for. So the seniors are going to come in like bees to like honey. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> she, she said everything better than I ever could have said it. To look, at these, to look at these classes and see Cisco certification classes, to see principles of biomedical sciences and principles mm -hmm. of engineering as elective classes. These are not, you know... These are elective classes that your juniors and seniors are going to be able to take at your high school next year. And if that doesn't get them excited, I'm going to go tell my daughter who graduated from a local high school about the classes she could have gotten if she were just two years younger than she is. You're a and mean dad. I am a mean dad, actually. And she's, these are the classes that she had hoped to have been able to take that she now wants to take. If she had found these things, she's now looking to get them in college. She could have had them in high school and would have been so happy and so thrilled to do it. And, and I, I hope a lot of juniors, current juniors, are there to hear and listen about the opportunity, the option that they have and the opportunity that we're trying to provide for them. <clears throat> and I would just like to, to echo the superintendent's kudos to the high school because I've been very interested in, in this with my daughter who will be a senior at Mountain House High School next year with what the course selection was going to be. And I've been encouraging her to talk to her friends at school and tell them, you know, we're going to have a great, a great uh, offering for them next year. And so I will share this with her, and hopefully she can get some of her classmates to come to that meeting tomorrow night. Do you need extra copies to take to school with her tomorrow? <laughs> I, I have a few if you'd like them. And also we're relieved to know that we have at least one senior coming. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to that point, I... She, she said that she was afraid she would be the only senior, and I said, valedictorian. <laughs> <laughs> President of the senior class, the whole nine yards. <laughs> you know, that would be an amazing college.
language application. Yeah. <laughs> Everything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for your report. And again, thank you for all the work that's going on over there. Really good stuff. I'm excited to see. Well, I'm excited for tomorrow. See what's, you know, see the stuff and see the interest. Um, and Pasta, thank you for your comments. We appreciate that. And uh, item B is uh, DARE graduation dates. Anything further on that? Okay. Just for the board's information. And uh, presentation. Item A, Board Oversight of Foundations, PTA, Boosters, Organizations by Mr. Harold Freeman and Ms. Kelly Rem. Welcome. Again, good evening. Thank you for having me here. I, I have to comment that um, you know, the last time I think I was at one of your board meetings, we were trying to figure out how to get the high school built. So it's a very <coughs> exciting time for me to be here listening to these courses that I wish my son was able to take, but sadly we don't live in the district. Um, I am happy to be here tonight, though, to talk to you about uh, your foundations, PTAs, other school-related organizations. You know, the timing of this is a very good one for you because your district is obviously growing. Uh, you have a high school now, it's up and running. Uh, congratulations on that. And now you get the world of complications that, of course, comes with that. Um, as you get more and more activity by booster groups, as you get more and more activity by foundations, and I know as typical of, of boards all across the state, many of you come from backgrounds having worked with foundations that support school districts. What we usually find is that, you know, for all the thickness of the education code and all the issues that we're talking about, a lot of it comes down to um, how can you help the foundations as a school board through your communication with them, through your oversight, through your input, do what they're trying to do for you. It's an interesting situation where they want to be here to help you, and I'm here tonight to talk to you a little bit about what you can do to help them help you. It's starting to sound like a, a movie that I know of a, a certain line. Help me help you. Um, so uh, this is who we are. Um, just by way of introduction, quickly, I'm going to be talking through some of the general principles with this. Uh, my colleague Kelly has actually spent some time with your board policies not only going through your policies and administrative regulations to see what they say now, but also to do some comparison about what other school districts around the state are doing. So she's going to take you through a bit more of a forensic piece of this to, to do some comparisons and chat about some of the rules that are out there and also some of the rules for the education code. So that'll be our structure for tonight. Um, there's a basic rule through all of this, and we'll come back and talk in more detail. The education code provides very simply that if somebody is going to fundraise in the name of the school district or of one of your schools, they need your permission to do it. So one of the basic questions always is, what authority do we have as a school district, as a school board, to help oversee, to give input to these foundations? And the answer is to a large extent as much as you'd like, because it's really an agreement between the foundations or the other organizations in the district if they want to fundraise in your name they've generally got to comply with your rules for fundraising under your name. And it, this is really the source of what that relationship is. Uh, it's usually a very collaborative, it's usually a very cooperative relationship. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, when we talk about foundations, what is a foundation? And there's so many different things that can fall within definitions of booster group foundation. Um, interestingly, your board policies follow the general rule for California because they're based on California School Boards Association model. 900 plus school districts in the state use a model similar to this um, that has two different board policies. One is a policy on school connected organizations where you specifically talk about organizations like PTOs and I'll talk a little bit about those, organizations like booster clubs. And there's fairly extensive rules laid out in your policies about that. And again, Kelly will walk you through those a little bit. Then you have a separate board policy, and again, this is not atypical, for educational foundations that are treated completely separately and have almost no rules that apply to them. And as, as a lawyer, that's always a bit of an anomaly to me because usually what you're talking about is a 501c3 charitable organization or other organization that's, that's been organized to raise funds for particular parts of the district or particular programs or the district at large, and yet you're treating them very differently. And that was one of the things we wanted to call to your attention tonight. Again, that comes from a CSBA model that has probably been around for you know, 40 or 50 years in its current form. And one of the interesting things, we'll talk to you about a, a publication by an organization, FICMAT, the Fiscal Crisis Management Team, that talks about accounting for ASB funds. And as they go through the book, there's a chapter on foundations, 
and booster groups where they say up front, when we say booster group, we mean foundation. When we say foundation, we mean booster group. So one of the things I want to do tonight is sort of open uh, the possibility that perhaps the two really shouldn't be treated that differently, um, that they really are more the same than different. And just to take you through for some of the terminology, really, we talk about foundations, uh, we talk about PTAs, Parent Teacher Association. They obviously have common goals, betterment of the school program, support of the school district. Uh, there's obviously a difference there too, though. Um, PTA is generally a, affiliated with a national or state organization. They are not their own independent body that is there just to support your district the way typically a foundation would be. And again, those, those um, foundations are usually 501c3 corporations. PTA is a 501c3 at a national level or a state level. They're not their own local corporation, nonprofit corporation for you. Um, they both enjoy tax exempt status because of the relationship with the 501c3. Uh, but there's some differences as you go through them. I mentioned PTAs are affiliated with this national organization. You have to pay dues to be a member. Uh, you're bound by their rules if you're operating within the PTA. Often there's a PTA at each particular school will have their own PTA. Some school districts, usually smaller districts, will have one PTA for the whole district. Uh, and their scope can cover all sorts of things, like lobbying and analysis of what's happening with the education code, as well as certainly some fundraising branches. Whereas an educational foundation, you're usually talking about um, and not necessarily a fee base where somebody has to be uh, pay a fee to belong. They're usually tied directly to one of your schools as opposed to any sort of a national organization. And that makes a tremendous difference because their rules of operation are ones they're going to come up with themselves. And I know that you talked about a goal moving forward for the district of communications. One of our themes tonight is the communication between the district and your staff and the board on the one hand and these foundations on the other is incredibly critical. Um, and most of the, the bad news will tell you tonight of where things go awry often come about because of that lack of, of oversight, that lack of communication. Whereas PTA often functions as a, a somewhat more independent group, although clearly communication again really is critical for them. I also wanted to point out the difference between a PTA and a PTO. Um, I thought for years, I've been working with school districts about 21 years, I'd hear certain districts I work with talking about PTOs, and I just thought they weren't enunciating. PTA, <laughs> and it took me years to figure out a parent-teacher organization is a local organization that is not affiliated with PTA. And there's different reasons in different school districts for it. But for our purposes of tonight, if you have a PTO, and that PTO is engaged in fundraising for the school district, Really, you're talking about the same kinds of parameters that you're talking about foundations with booster clubs. So I'm going to use a lot of those terms a little bit uh, interchangeably under the heading of foundations tonight because the same rules do generally apply. So benefits of foundations. Obviously, there's tremendous benefits to be had from foundations. Um, they involve your community. They get volunteers. Um, I won't ask for a show of hands because I already know most of you are involved with various foundations for school districts along the way. Um, they, you know, they breed board members, which is a good thing. Uh, that's where a lot of board members in the state come from, and they support volunteerism um, tremendously. They help bring the parents in in ways that you can't always do to help contribute in various ways to the school district. When we talk about contributing to the school district, obviously, first and foremost, often on our minds, is a financial basis for all of this. Um, with the budget cuts that California's experienced over the years, going all the way back to Proposition 13, so you know, going back to when I was a, a young lad in public school in California a thousand years ago, um, you, ha you have these foundations increasingly playing a part in filling in those gaps that you have for particular programs um, for the school district. And that's really come to the forefront now more than ever because of litigation the last few years that was brought challenging the charging of school fees um, throughout the state of California that led to legislation in 2011 and 2012 that really put into firmer terms than it's ever been in California what had already existed in case law. There is a constitutional guarantee to a free public education in California, which means you can't charge for a lot of things unless the legislature tells you that you can. And there's a very long, confusing list now laid out in the legislation of what you can charge for and what you can't. So you can charge for uh, PE uniforms, but you can't charge for school uniforms. There's, there's all of these distinctions throughout. Unless the legislature says you can charge for it, you can't. 
And that really pulled the plug for a lot of school districts that were, for example, charging participation fees for kids to be, as one example, in instrumental music, to help pay for the instruments, to pay for the participation. It's very clear now, you can ask for donations, but that's all you can do. So the last few years, we've increasingly seen foundations step in to pick up the role as, whether they're called booster groups or otherwise, in supporting particular programs, lab sciences, uh, various different extracurriculars, speech and debate, again, music, all of these different programs. So more now than ever, foundations really are paying, playing a critical role, particularly at the high school level, um, where districts around the state really have been devastated by the limitation on what they can charge families. Um, so more and more we're relying on these foundations. So what we're gonna take you through tonight is some best practices for the school district around the foundations, and then some best practices for the foundations themselves. Um, and that's something that certainly for if there's representatives tonight to, to listen to, but for the district to be able to communicate to these foundations as well. Um, beyond that, we're gonna tell you a few examples of where things have gone wrong. And these are all, we're gonna talk to you tonight about a lot of air quote hypotheticals. Um, again, we've been doing this for 21 years. We've seen what works and we've certainly experienced what hasn't. And you can usually, for any story I tell you, just go Google it online and you wanna find out where it happened because they're usually in the news. Um, but I won't tell you tonight because I'm going to protect the identity of my other clients. Um, so taking you, <laughs> taking you through the uh, educational foundations and the best practices, there's just kind of an overview of some of what comes out of this FICMAT publication. And again, uh, FICMAT is an organization most of you are probably familiar with. They, they come in in crisis. You know, they come in and they help school districts when there have been um, significant issues, they come in and they do audits of school districts financially, audits of special education programs. Uh, great organization, and I don't say that only because we've served as their legal counsel as well. Um, they, they really are a great organization, but they have this ASB book, which is hundreds of pages of long, which talks about how to control, take care of, audit, account for ASB funds that are held by these actual in-school organizations. Um, and so I always thought, well, that would have nothing to do with foundations. But lo and behold, in getting ready for this, um, I learned something. We made it all the way to page 185. And they actually have best practices laid out for outside foundations as well. Um, it's a smaller part of the book. It's a great publication that um, it's worth looking at. So we sort of pulled together some of the best practices for school districts in dealing with foundations. And remember that FICMAP doesn't make the distinction your policies do. Foundation, booster group, PTO, Nonprofits all are treated similarly for these purposes. So what they talk about is the importance of having these organizations actually file an application with the district. Um, that's kind of counterintuitive because they're out raising funds, but remember they're doing it in your name. They're using the name of your school, the name of your school district. So actually having you know who's out there doing that and getting clearance upfront for them so that they know they can use your name is a step that school districts all over the state skip all the time. Um, I've been in school districts before where they had no idea there was some foundation out there raising money for them until something went wrong. And then suddenly they find out, or they get a check, there's a, something that went right, and they say, well, this is lovely, there's a foundation in the name of our elementary school. Where did that come from? So this is really part of the communication, is requiring those applications up front um, and updating it annually. It, not only an update, but what FICMAT recommends is with a, an identification of activities planned for the next year. It's very nice for all of you to know what fundraising activities are actually gonna be occurring as opposed to just getting that check at the end. Um, again, so you can support the group, the group can support you. Um, submitting a copy of the Constitution and the bylaws to the district, if a, an, an outside foundation is gonna be a 501c3, and by all means, we think they should be a 501c3. There's protections built in for that organization, particularly on tax basis so that they know when they're raising funds for you that this is not taxable income to anybody. Um, but if they go through that process, they have to have bylaws, they'll file with the Secretary of State. That's all useful information that you should have. And what we like to see in superintendent's office is a binder of all of those bylaws. And I will tell you right now, a fraction of the districts we work with actually have that. Um, so that if there's a question that a parent has that somebody else has, you can pull that together in fairly short order. Um, ensuring renewal applications include financial documents and budgets. You can help these foundations, especially ones getting off the ground, by asking them to provide you with a budget. Why is that? Because they're forced to prepare a budget. 
Um, a lot of times well-meaning folks come together wanting to, to earn money for the school district to fundraise and support you without really having a plan. And you can help gently guide them towards that plan by asking them for that plan up front so that you know what's involved. It's also a check and a balance. So if there's some fundraiser listed in there that causes you concern, that doesn't sound like it's age appropriate, that sounds like it may have some liability risks, even though the foundation may be the ones carrying that risk, it's an opportunity for you to raise your hand and again, offer assistance to them. We have some concerns, you might wanna look at this. Um, classic example would be a, a, a hypothetical situation that I'm aware of where a school district foundation, a booster group had a ski trip where they took kids to Lake Tahoe. Um, well, as it turns out in Lake Tahoe, there was gambling and alcohol, I mean, who knew? Um, <laughs> and there wasn't necessarily checks and balances in place with the, the students who were going, appropriate numbers of chaperones. So even though it wasn't a school district event, I assure you that when things did not go quite perfectly, the school district was, was mentioned prominently in the newspaper for quite some time. They had no idea any of this was happening and had been happening for years. Um, that is a district that has since taken much greater involvement in its foundations. Um, it's one of those, those stories that we tell. Um, and then authorizing the district to audit financial statements. There is no law that says the school district shall audit the financial statements of these foundations. There's nothing that requires it. But again, remember, for the funds to be raised in the name of the school district or of a particular school, you have the right to condition that on the ability to audit those funds. Um, most of the school districts I know that actually conduct audits of a foundation's books are districts where there has been a problem with the foundation before. And I always like to tell people, get ahead of that and help them in advance. And again, it's helping the foundations. Because if you're seeing errors in bookkeeping, if you're seeing questions about how records are being maintained, it's your opportunity to help that organization by pointing that out, um, by having your professional staff involved and being able to cast eyes on this and say, here's a suggestion we have about the way that you approach these issues. Um, some other best practices along the way, um, your board policies and regulations, you know, we, I mentioned that your board policies right now, you have this bifurcated policy that separates out different kinds of organizations. Maybe something that you wanna look at moving forward. It's always been a bit of a curiosity to me. And there are districts in the state that have done away with that distinction, that have pulled it all into one set of policies. Um, and keeping up to date, I think this is one of those areas where policy review on a fairly regular basis, if not annual, close there too, is not a bad idea to make sure that your policies and regulations are tracking your reality. Um, you want your policies to be aspirational but realistic to make sure that they're really lining up. Um, be aware of who's raising funds for you. I already talked about that a little bit. Um, coordinating with the foundation leadership to establish ground rules, just rules of engagement. How will they use the district's name? How will the funds flow to the school district and what are the objectives? Um, here's, a, here's a tip that is also out of the FICMAP publication, but it's one that we often advise. There's a difference between the district accepting funds earmarked for something. And legally, if you receive funds, the board is entitled to receive funds, to receive donations. If somebody's conditioned that donation, you can decide to accept it conditioned on that, on that use. So if they say this, we want this to be used particularly for this language program at this school, the board can decide is that something you want to accept it for. You can earmark the funds accordingly and use the funds that way. And the attorney general has looked at that before and said that's all a fine practice. Where we run into trouble is where foundations decide that they'll hire somebody or that they'll bring in a contractor to do work and I'll share some stories with you around that as opposed to giving you earmarked funds you know as a school board that there are particular rules that you have to follow when you hire people, uh, public bidding requirements for certain public works projects, when prevailing wages are paid and when they're not. And almost inevitably when foundations are the ones that try to build the object, hire the contractor, hire the vendor who's gonna come in, or even hire the employee who's gonna work in the school district, not all of the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. So we strongly, strongly recommend, as does FICMAT as a practice, that you condition the receipt of these funds is give the funds. They can be earmarked, but give the funds, don't hire the person. And again, I'll give you some specific examples of that. And lastly, and this seems obvious, is don't commingle district and foundation funds. By that, I don't mean once it's donated to you, I mean before it's donated to you. So there are instances along the way where school districts to help out have said, well, just foundation, give us your money, and we'll keep it in a bank account, we'll earmark it. 
but then that foundation has to meet its obligations as a 501c3 corporation, it's keep its own books, be able to show what it's doing that gets confused by that commingling. So another recommendation is to avoid that. Um, we also have best practices for the organizations themselves, and, and this is really tips for the foundations that the board can share, that the district can share and staff can share. Um, one of the things we always say is establish core leadership groups and have a purpose when you have a foundation. Um, when you come together, you want to have a shared vision of what it is that you're doing. A lot of the times we've seen foundations fail, it's that lack of a common vision and a leadership at the outset. It's, it's well-meaning people who come together and then go in a thousand different directions. Um, so I, I always use this as an example. I am a member of a booster group at my son's high school, which is the music, instrumental music booster group. There's a very clear message up front. We know it's for instrumental music. We know it's for at this high school, and we're told up front, this is not just for the marching band. It's a little speech they always give us because there's always an assumption that all the parents make all the money goes to the marching band because they're the biggest consumer. Well, there's an orchestra. Money goes to the orchestra as well. There's a symphonic band. The money goes to them as well. So we join the organization knowing there is this specific purpose, this agreed vision. Um, consulting with school and community leaders prior to formation, always a good idea to get the input. Um, obtaining a tax identification number and tax exempt status. Again, if you're gonna be raising funds, there are all sorts of nasty tax implications if you haven't gotten yourself properly set up as a 501c3. And when I say properly set up, there are also groups that jump the gun. So they submit all the right paperwork and then they're off and running. You wanna make sure that you actually have registered with the Secretary of State. You wanna make sure that you are recognized as a 501c3 before you get out too far ahead in collecting donations, which people are giving to you on the assumption it's tax deductible when it may not be yet, and that gets some foundations in trouble. Um, obtaining financial account and maintaining good records, obviously very critical elements, um, and developing bylaws, which is gonna be required in any event if you're gonna move forward as a 501c3. Um, I mentioned earlier the free school guarantee. One thing that we've only recently started doing is having school districts really spend some time with foundations, helping them understand what the school district can charge for and can't charge for. Having a foundation go out and raise funds for something that you legally can already charge a student for isn't gonna be as helpful as having them target those areas where you can't charge students and that you can have them go out. I'm gonna use again, I'm an instrumental music parent, um, buying the trumpet for the band. You can't require a kid to provide their own trumpet. That's a great place where foundations can step in and help fund leasing, renting, or buying a trumpet um, and working through that way. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention on this is as the legislation was coming through um, after this, this lawsuit that was filed in 2010 to look at this, what fee can be charged and what can't, the initial legislation to settle the case was much more expansive than the legislation that went in. It was vetoed by Jerry Brown. Um, it was one of the happier vetoes I've seen because one of the things it would have done is required all the same rules for foundation supporting schools as it does for schools and school districts around the free school guarantee. What that means is that you could not require somebody to pay to participate in a foundation. Um, you, it really limited even your ability to get voluntary payments into the foundation. It would have just cut the legs off of fundraising and that's why it was vetoed and the legislation that ultimately went into effect didn't have that, but it really spelled out the importance of understanding this, everybody, all the people, all the key players in this, understanding this free school guarantee truly what the school can charge and what it can't. Um, because of that, there's this mindset still, you don't wanna tell people as members of your foundation, um, if you, you have to pay to play. Even though that bill didn't pass, there's, there's the spirit of that legislation that's still out there, telling somebody as part of a foundation, you know, you parent, if you wanna be a member of this foundation, you have to work this car wash. Um, indentured servitude is very frowned upon by the Constitution. <laughs> you really want to be able to have equal access to the foundation, equal participation, and pick up some of those ideas of that free school guarantee. Um, coordinating with the school district to address budget needs, that's again to make sure the foundations are targeting what's most useful for you. And I'll give you some examples of that in a bit. And considering issues of equity, um, a specific illustration of that would be is there's a foundation that is funding a trip of kids, whatever the trip is, you know, historical purposes to Washington, D.C., things that the school district is limited to charge in. 
um, it's very important to consider whether you've created a situation where only the kids in the foundation who are themselves making the donation get to go. And so these issues of, of equity and equality are ones that you want to educate your foundations on. They're the principles that you follow and generally the principles that you're probably going to want your foundations to follow. Harold, can I ask you a follow-up question on that? There are outside groups that take students to Washington, D.C., and do the rules still apply if it's not through the school and it's done like over spring break? Yeah, generally speaking, if it's... Because it's not related to the school. Right. It's ABC organization that somebody's mom hooked up with, mm -hmm. and they're going to Washington, D.C., but they have to pay. Yeah, that is a completely separate, it's not a school-sponsored activity, okay. and, and so if somebody can't pay, they can't go. Now, if a foundation is the one that's contributing to that and paying for it, mm -hmm. they probably have to look long and hard by their bylaws, by their conversations with the district, are they going to say no to somebody who can't pay? Um, but there are outside organizations, as we all know, on a, a fairly regular basis that are out there running these programs. But legally, if a foundation were sponsoring a trip like that, they could say you have to pay for this? It technically depends on their bylaws. Mm, okay. um, it, you also get in some issues around the 501c3, the charitable foundation purpose of it. So it's, it, you're starting to get into a, a messier area. Most of these, I went to Spain again, I'm gonna keep talking about the band. I went to Spain with the band this last summer. I paid to go to Spain, I paid for my kids to go to Spain, there was no scholarship. But it was completely unaffiliated either with the music foundation or the, the school district or the school. Okay. So those programs do exist. Um, another thing for the uh, educational or for the uh, for the foundation or the organization again I'm using foundation very broadly um, coordinating with the district regarding the use of the logo you know the logo of Mountain House High School for example is your logo it is the school district's logo I think some of you are aware that some others tried to make some money off of your logo before the school even opened with some sale of some goods but um, the district appropriately sort of nipped that in the bud um, it is your logo, and it's important for the foundation to understand when they can use their logo, your logo and when they can't. The last thing you want to see is the foundation putting something out that you don't feel comfortable with as a school district that's got the logo of the high school, the mascot, and it looks like your document. So some school districts just have a practice of if you're going to use our logo, it has to go through the superintendent first. It has to be cleared, and I think that's a, a very useful approach. Um, and then dealing with cash, you know, one of the things that is a challenge for booster groups, for foundations, they deal in cash, right? They have fundraisers, they do the car wash, people are paying cash. As much as possible, you don't want people handling cash for obvious reasons that I will talk to you about in a little bit. Um, if you are going to have them using cash, the more that the foundation can move to a process, the more you can help educate them on it of checks and balances, the better which means if cash is being handled, it should always be handled by at least two people. At least one of them should be an officer of the foundation. They should be each counting the same cash. Um, the cash should be getting immediately deposited. The longer the delay, the easier it is for those little dollar bills to go off missing. Um, and we've seen cases where it looked for all the world like somebody was embezzling money, and then it turned out that the, somebody with the foundation had collected $2,000 in cash from an event and forgot to deposit it. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life. Remember the movie, you know, where, with Uncle Billy who left the money sitting somewhere? Those really happen in real life. So those checks and balances are, are really critical. And you'll find with a high school in particular, the, the volume of money, the dollar amount starts increasing of what gets collected. So let's talk a little bit about the potential pitfalls. Um, I thought this was a good graphic. You know, we're all well-meaning and suddenly the earth opens up sometimes and swallows us as we're driving along. I wanted to share with you just a few examples of where we've seen foundations go off the track, where things have not worked well. And these range from situations that have been, resulted in black eyes to foundations losing their nonprofit status to people going to jail. So they really run the gambit. And I want to share these with you because, again, it kind of illustrates the importance of the communication and the oversight role. And then when I'm through this, um, we're going to have Kelly actually talk to you specifically now about what does your policy say today and what do other districts do, and what are some of the relevant state laws. So let me give you an example of a well-meaning group. Um, there was a well-meaning booster group that decided that there should be a press box. There didn't, wasn't one existed at the football stadium for a high school. So they had all the risers and everything was lovely, but there was really no press box. So you had people standing off on the sidelines doing, making the announcements and whatnot. Um, they talked to the principal about their desire to, to put in a press box, and that principal 
who was fairly new as a principal and with the district, who did not really think about who it had to be communicated with, said, that sounds like a great idea. So one weekend, a crew came in, poured a cement pad. Um, this was a local contractor who was donating his time, oh. poured the cement pad, <laughs> and came in and built, with the help of a bunch of parent volunteers, built a lovely press box. I mean, really nice looking press box which of course was probably 30 feet off the ground because it was at top of the risers and everything else. To get to the press box, they put in a flight of stairs, which might better be described almost as a ladder. Um, and so they were done, and the next week the principal goes to the high, to sees this and sort of thinks, maybe I should have talked to somebody in the district office. <laughs> and they do a little bit of looking, and this is where things went wrong. Um, let's start with the fact that it was not run through in any way the Division of State Architect, even though it's a structural building on a school ground which has to be run by the DSA. So it was immediately red tagged and couldn't be used. Secondly, the way to get in was clearly not handicapped accessible, so you had an ADA violation. And it was probably just not that safe. There were these open, very thin, it was like somebody had leaned a ladder over essentially to get up 30 feet. Um, so not the best planning. And then you get into the pouring of the pad. Well, the pad was poured by a contractor donating his time. Nothing wrong with that. But the law says that if he's paying his employees to do that work, it has to be treated as a public work project with prevailing wages paid. And he did not pay his employees prevailing wages. So he was potentially subject to a wage claim by his employees. So he donated his time, and he potentially got in trouble. And to make a long story short, it was a very sad day when the bulldozer came and knocked it all down. Um, and this was not a small expenditure. The booster group really had put a lot of money. It was a steel box. It was, it was a significant um, donation. That's why you coordinate. That's why you talk to each other. And the happy news to that story is that the booster group ultimately went out, raised over $100,000, donated it to the school district, earmarked for a press box. They now have a lovely ADA accessible press box with ramps and the whole thing. Um, so that's the happy ending. But that's the importance of communicating up front. Um, another example to share with you, and we, we lawyers refer to these as war stories, but they're, they're good illustrations. Um, slightly different situation, another, I don't know why this always happens with athletic fields. There was a high school with an athletic <laughs> field. They were um, upgrading the field, putting in new lights, doing some other nice things for it, but they didn't have the budget to upgrade the sound system, and that sound system was kind of outdated. So the booster group for that high school said, we'll pay for it. We'll, we'll go out, and we, we know some people. We'll make a deal. And we'll buy some speakers that is like a very sophisticated speaker system, and that's what we can go with. And the school district said that sounds delightful. So here's the problem with receiving stuff instead of money. They went out and they bought it. Arguably, they didn't have to go through any public bidding because they weren't buying on, on behalf of the district. They were buying it for the booster group. But what they bought was had a greater need for electrical input than was existing on the field. So there just wasn't coordination in that regard. Um, the district realized this. They decided they'd spend some more bond money than they'd already spent on the project, spent close to $30,000 upgrading the electrical to accommodate this new system. But somewhere along the way, the booster group started having a disagreement about whether this was the right thing to do and the best place to spend the money. And bear in mind that they had raised the funds for this $60,000 sound system by telling people, we are raising funds for a $60,000 sound system. Will you donate? So everybody who donated, donated knowing it was for this system. Ultimately, a lot of people got unhappy with each other, and one day the booster president walked into the local middle school run by another school district, an elementary school district, and said, here, you want these $60,000 speakers, which is not what the funds had been raised for. They'd been raised for the high school. Complete lack of coordination that could have utterly been avoided if there was an understanding up front, what system are we going to put in, what's it going to cost, foundation, you raise the money, you donate it to us, we'll go out to public bidding, and we'll install it. We'll coordinate it at our end. Would have cleared up all of that. And that one didn't have a happy ending. The, the district never got the speakers. They ultimately went missing. Um, the foundation lost its 501c3 status and was reported for investigation to the attorney general. That's one of those sad stories in the end. And in the beginning, it was all well-intentioned. It was just the lack of coordination, lack of communication. Um, two more examples for you, and I'm, these are going to get increasingly worse, so this will never happen with your foundations, I promise. Um, but these things happen. Another foundation. Quote you on that, people. right? I'm sorry? That promise, we can quote you on that, right? Well, I will never be involved with any of those foundations. <laughs> I promise you that. Um, we had a, a school district. This was another high school district, actually. It was not athletics. It was a, a, an academic 
booster group, basically foundation that supported the, the school as a whole. And they decided they'd raise funds by running a bingo game. And so they had an off, they did it offsite, they didn't serve alcohol, lovely, they ran their bingo game. The problem with that, and Kelly will talk to you more about these rules, is that there's very strict rules in the penal code about who can run uh, bingo games, how they can run it, because it's a game of chance, it's gambling. And one of the many rules that is listed is you cannot pay somebody to work at a bingo game. And it turned out that the, this foundation, in thankfulness to the various people they had helping them in this, were paying various volunteers to work at the bingo games, which as it turns out in California is a crime. It's actually a felony. Um, it's a serious crime. So happily, nobody got arrested. They changed their practices and life was good. But that, again, shows they tried to do something with good intentions. And then the last example I'll give you, and there's too many of these to relate, um, is unfortunately, from time to time, there is somebody who, in a moment of um, poor reason and great need, borrows some money from a foundation. It's a very nice way of saying an embezzler, uh, which is legally what it's, what it's called. Um, there have been a rash of embezzlement cases throughout California, specifically at school districts for a decade plus now, that I, I think a lot probably goes back to the recession. Um, I'll give you a personal example, which is, and this is actually PTA. I, I was a member of the PTA. My wife was on the board of the PTA for our local school. And we were all astonished to learn that the treasurer for the PTA embezzled almost $60,000 from that PTA. And we knew this person personally. This was a good person. This was a nice person. We didn't see it coming. What we didn't know is her husband had cancer and they couldn't afford the, the treatments. And the, the PTA did not have checks and balances. This, all the money was going right to the, uh, to the treasurer and all of that money was going right to Kaiser Hospital. Um, as opposed to the school district. So all of this is by way of saying those best practices that we talk about, um, there are horror stories out there. And sometimes they're inadvertent, like the bingo group or the, the trying to put up the press box. Sometimes they're a little more nefarious, like the strange story of those speakers that went missing or, or the embezzlers. The best thing that you can do is empower your uh, various fundraising groups to know that they're doing it right, sharing your knowledge on this with them, sharing the expertise of your staff with them. Not a gift of public funds, by the way, um, to, to have you work with those organizations just to share your knowledge. Um, and really have rules that they are not allowed to raise funds for you until such time as you have ground rules established between the two of you, because it's actually not just protecting the district, it's protecting those folks as well. Um, for the rest of the presentation, what we're gonna do, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Kelly. I made her dig through all of these different policies around the state. And it was, seemed unfair to not let her come tonight and tell you what she found by comparison. <laughs> so we'll let her tell you about that. Okay, thank you, Harold, and pleasure to be here and meet all of you this evening. Um, so I'm gonna start with this district's policies and I just wanna cover the ones that are on point. We've actually attached them to the back of your handout. Um, and what I have up on the screen is just some of the key elements of each one that I wanted to discuss. And then once I get through this district's policies, we're gonna cover a couple of other districts around the state just to see what, what they're doing um, differently. And what I wanna emphasize up front is that it's not that there's any necessary, necessarily right or wrong answer on how to write these. It depends on the district's preferences and the circumstances in the individual district. But one of the best ways to implement some of the best practices that Harold just covered is through your board policies and regulations. So the first one here is board policy 1230. And and as Harold mentioned, the uh, district's policies treat school-connected organizations separately from educational foundations. Um, this board policy is related to school-connected organizations. And what it does, is it specifies that they are separate legal entities. Um, and there's the um, kind of the requirement right there where that re requiring the organizations to submit a request for authorization to the board before they can fundraise in the name of the district. So that's spelled out right in the policy. And that kind of echoes the education code. Um, the, this board policy also says that the superintendent shall establish appropriate internal controls for the relationship between the organization and the district. The reason that's relevant is because it uses the word shall, and as you'll see later, there's other districts out there that say use the word may. So it's permissive and not mandatory. Um, so in that case, this district has a little bit more um, uh, oversight in that regard. 
And it also says that the school connected organizations may consult with the principal to determine school needs. So in that case, not a requirement, but a permissive um, aspect of the policy. Okay, going along with that is the administrative regulation 1230. And what this says is that uh, it, it first of all specifies what requests for authorization must contain. I've got it listed up there, um, the name and purpose, date of application, bylaws. Um, there also has to be an agreement that the organization will not engage in unlawful discrimination. Um, certain names, addresses, and phone numbers of officers, objectives. It also has to include an agreement to grant the district the right to audit the group's financial records at any time. Note that that's a right to audit the records. It's not necessarily um, laying out, you know, how often those records will be audited or anything like that. Name of the bank where the accounts are located, signature of the superintendent, and an agreement to provide evidence of liability insurance. Okay, um, so that's what must be in the request for authorization. Uh, subsequent to that, the um, authorizations are presented to the superintendent annually along with financial statements. Um, and at any point, if the superintendent proposes to deny the request, he presents that recommendation to the board. And upon the consent of the, of the superintendent, there's that requirement again for the Ed Code, the organizations may use the school's name, team logo, or um, team name. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so here's the board policy that relates to educational foundations. And this one actually has a lot less extensive requirements in it. Um, it's, it first kind of states more of a, a purpose or an intent. The board desires to work cooperatively with the foundations to determine the purpose for which funds may be used to meet changing needs of the district and students. So again, that's more aspirational than it is a specific requirement. Um, it also recognizes that the foundation is a separate legal entity. Um, the policy states that foundations are encouraged, not required, to provide regular reports to the board. And there's that same requirement again for foundations to get the consent of the superintendent in order to use the district's name or school name or logo. Okay, so, so that's kind of an overview of what your current policies are in the district. And now I'm just going to tell you about some of the other ones that we found. And I'm, we tried to find sort of an array of less restrictive, more restrictive requirements and just additional language. So this is from Montebello USD, it's their board policy 1230. And we consider this to be less regu regulation than what your district has. Basically says that um, the organizations are required to have a written statement of purpose and bylaws. Aside from that, it just specifies that the, dis the superintendent may establish controls for the relationship. And remember, in your policy, it required the superintendent to establish those controls. Santa Barbara USD, their policy specifically related to foundations, 1260. Um, I didn't even quote any language up there because it actually had no language encouraging any reports to the board, like the Lammersville policy says. Um, it also doesn't have the language requiring consent to use the district's name or logo at all. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's still not the law under the education code, it's just not included specifically in their board policy. Okay, Campbell Union High School District, they have a bit more extensive board policy, 1230. Um, the difference here is that the items that are required to be submitted with the request for authorization are actually spelled out in the board policy instead of um, the regulation, which is, was, you know, in, in your board policy, it's left to the superintendent's discretion to come up with those requirements. Um, here, they're actually spelled out right in the board policy. And um, this board policy also requires the organizations to grant the board the right to audit their financial records at any time. Again, that's in your regulation, it's not in your board policy. So this one's just structured a little bit differently. Okay, Clovis USD has slightly more stringent requirements, and this district actually did something a little bit different from most of the others that we've seen. For one thing, they appear to have this board policy 9213 that applies to all types of organizations. It doesn't appear to make a distinction between um, the, the foundations versus other types of organizations. They still use school-connected organizations, but they don't have a separate policy for foundations. And here, um, if you'll recall, your policy said that the organizations may consult with the principal. This actually requires them to do so. Um, also, Clovis's board policy states that each school ha may have one single nonprofit 
organization operating under um, 501c3 and any other groups wishing to organize are uh, operating under the umbrella of that single nonprofit organization that probably allows them to have a little bit more oversight in what's going on um, they the associated regulation for Clovis 9213 um, it has heightened submission requirements for the authorization to form and some of the things that they require are that any revisions or updates to bylaws procedures or rules have to be submitted to the district within a, within a month after they are approved by the organization um, they added that the IRS determination letter must be submitted and they also have very specific um, they require these financial reports with very specific audit requirements some of the things for example depending on um, the amount of annual revenue of the organization that dictates how often the audits have to happen whether it can be by um, school district personnel versus a CPA so those are also issues um, to think about okay just a couple more examples here Santa Paula USD their board policy 1230 addresses some issues that we haven't really looked at yet um, the first bullet there is just that funds raised shall generally benefit a single school but they also address equity concerns and this is related to um, you know for example athletic programs and providing equivalent opportunities for males and females and their policy says that the board is responsible for ensuring that the district's athletic program provides equivalent those equivalent opportunities and that the booster club activities must be included in the district's analysis of those opportunities so that's definitely um, a heightened requirement both for the foundation but also for the district who's in the board who's having to review that uh, one other aspect of Santa Paula's board policy is that if a concern arises regarding the equitable distribution of funds it actually lays out what should happen in that case and it's the superintendent consults with the leadership of the organization and district legal counsel okay and the last one is Davis joint USD board policy 1230 again they've got additional language that we don't see in Lammersville's policies um, one is that the board desires so it's not really a requirement so much as just um, a an intent or a purpose that the organizations do not discriminate and Harold touched on this a little bit earlier saying that you can't discriminate based on um, whether or not the family of the student is a, um, a member of the organization or whether they've donated to the organization um, another aspect and I'll talk about the education code requirements just a minute related to food sales um, but this board policy actually refers to that right in the policy by saying that food sales by outside organizations cannot compete with district school nutrition program and must comply with the nutritional standards of the education code which are very specific and again I'll talk about those in just a minute okay um, and then here again is kind of a remedy for what happens if the organization's activities appear to conflict with law or with board policy um, in Davis's board policy they lay out exactly what's going to happen the superintendent shall request necessary information for a review shall communicate an appropriate remedy if necessary and then if the organization fails to comply the superintendent can recommend um, to the board that the authorization be revoked okay so those are just kind of some samples again no right or wrong answers there but there's a lot of different things going on and we just kind of wanted to get you all thinking about what may or may not be included in in board policies regulating these organizations um, and with that I'm just going to change gears a little bit and talk a, kind of briefly about fundraising activities and just some of the state law related to these activities this is by no means intended to be an exhaustive discussion of everything that a foundation needs to think about um, because we certainly don't have time for that but just a, a few issues that we wanted to raise tonight the first is education code 51521 this goes back to the very first slide that Harold mentioned it's kind of the fundamental rule um, that allows districts to have oversight responsibility over uh, foundations what the section says is that no person shall solicit any other person to contribute any fund or to purchase any item of personal property upon the representation that the money received is to be used wholly or in part to benefit to the benefit of any public school or the student body of any public school unless such person obtains the prior written approval of the governing board of the school district or the board's designee the one caveat I wanted to give here is that the end of this section actually says that um, there's an this doesn't apply if the <coughs> proceeds are going to be basically hundred percent delivered to a public school and 
that surprises people sometimes that this wouldn't apply in that case, but actually I think what happens very commonly is there might be, say, for example, a small administrative fee that's applied when, or someone who is, um, you know, something that has to get paid out of the donation. And so that's a nice segue to the app that we were discussing earlier and the issue that came up about the 1% fee um, and where that might come in. So in that case, maybe 100% of the funds aren't actually being delivered to the school district and therefore the rule applies. Um, so most of the time, um, for a foundation to raise money in the name of the district, they are going to need to get the prior written approval. Okay, now we have a quick hypothetical for you uh, to consider, and I'm hoping for a little bit of participation on spotting some of the issues with this one. Um, and actually, I'm just going to read it off really quickly. Okay, so we have an organization associated with a school, and they hold a fundraiser where they sell ceramic tiles to parents with the intent that their students can decorate the tiles and then the tiles would be placed on a wall in the school which would be named the Great Wall of Art. So one of the students paints a Bible verse on the tile and he submits it to the PTA and the PTA refuses to include it on the wall because they don't want to include religious messages. So the student's parents complain and ultimately they hire a lawyer and the lawyer sends a nasty letter to the district and that is the first time the district has ever heard of this entire project. So anyone want to share what kind of issues or problems they see with that scenario? Freedom of speech. <laughs> Absolutely. No communication with the district. Planned to improve facilities without a plan. Um, DSA. Yeah, DSA. Right. Um, yeah. Flip side to free speech is the separation of church and state. Exactly. The school district space and then by allowing for that. So when you've got five competing interests like that, having a lot of fun. Exactly. So that's what they were faced with in that case is this competing interest. And what do they do? At this point, they have sold these tiles. The kids have painted on them. They've taken money. Um, if they don't put this student's tile on the wall, the parents are going to sue them for... Um, free speech issues, if they do put it, someone else might complain about uh, religious issues, and ultimately it was a big mess. And then you raise really good issues about not communicating with the district, and you know, what about the facilities themselves? It actually turned out in this hypothetical situation that the wall they intended to put the tiles on was not even structurally sound enough to <laughs> hold this weight of all of these tiles. So I knew that was coming, it had to be. <laughs> But what about the parents' case where, you know, we, we purchased this and, you know, you can, let, let's say all those other issues didn't happen and right. the wall was going up. And the, you mean the parents who paid for the tile but were not going to put it up mm -hmm. on the wall? Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. There's another problem. I mean, the, the PTA or the organization in that case had represented that this was what we were taking money for and this is what we're going to do with this tile. Um, the kid actually went ahead and painted the Bible, Bible verse on it and at that point is the district going to have to step in and say, no, it can't go up there. The district doesn't probably want to be involved in making that decision at all. So it was a very messy hypothetical situation in yeah. that case. Wow. Yeah, we're going to be back in court like everybody else was. Yeah. Possibly. Wow. Hypothetical. <laughs> hypothetical court. Would that be moot court? All right. So just to close, I'm just going to cover a quick, um, a few examples of particular rules within California law that apply to fundraising activities by these organizations. And again, not an exhaustive list of all of the requirements that need to be complied with, but just some things that we see come up that um, we just thought that both the district and the board, as well as any foundations that have the benefit of this information, uh, might find important. So first you have some uh, rules in the government code related to fundraisers for charitable purposes. And this is annual registration requirements with the California Attorney General. And this whole statutory scheme essentially um, requires the Attorney General to set up additional regulation for what has to be submitted and to set up this charitable uh, registry of charitable organizations. There's very, very specific requirements what, for what has to happen there. Um, the Business and Professions Code sections applies also to solicitations for charitable purposes, and this one requires certain disclosures prior to making solicitations for donations. So, for example, um, there's a certain card or 
um, printed brochure that has to be it has to be handed out with specified information. There's also exceptions for seeking donations within the membership of the organization. Um, and I think the, this is the code section that also requires um, GAAP or general uh, accounting principles to be applied to the accounting for these foundations. Okay, in food sales, I mentioned one of the board policies that we looked at actually had a reference to um, the any food sales complying with the nutritional requirements of the um, education code. So here are some of them. And I've got four cited, two on this slide, two on the next slide. They vary by whether we're talking about elementary school students or um, middle and high school students. Some of them apply all day long. Some of them apply only one half an hour before to one half an hour after the school day. But um, in any case, foundations may or may not be aware of these requirements, may try to sell certain foods to raise money in the name of the district, and what do you know, they're actually violating the education code. So again, that's probably why some of the districts actually include this right up um, in their board policies. And there's also a limitation on serving any foods containing trans fats to all K-12 peoples. Okay, alcohol on school property, what better way to um, encourage Second people to point. open their wallets but to serve them alcohol? Uh, generally not allowed on school premises at all. However, there has been uh, new legislation on this just effective a couple weeks ago on January 1st. And what that new law says is that alcoholic beverages may be consumed at special events on school facilities where a license or permit has been acquired and students are not present. So I'm sorry kids, we'd like to let you go, but <laughs> we just yeah. can't do it. And they can't even be present. Um, so if you comply, if the foundation were to comply with these regulations, with this new law, then pr presumably they could have alcohol on a school uh, property during a non-school hours without students present. But even if they do that, there are always gonna be li liability concerns when you're serving alcohol. Um, and how nice would that be if somebody drinks too much at a you know, school foundation event and drives home and gets into an accident and the publicity alone with that would be pretty terrible. Do we have a uh, clarification on the definition of present within the code section? I don't think so. Um, like I said, that's, that's literally about all the, uh, that new exception says, just that they're not present. But I do uh, know that the- Is there the, a bill number that I could take a look at? Uh, yeah. Out of pure curiosity. I know I can see the B&P code, but was there a, a, I'd like to look at the bill. I don't know the it. bill offhand, but I can definitely get it. it for you. But um, I, I would say that the, the more important definition is public schoolhouse. Because if you look at that, it actually defines as not just the facilities, but any school grounds at all. So I'm assuming that if you've got a, found a, a fundraiser going on in the gym and there's students out on the playground, um, that I would think there's a significant risk that you're violating this section. So if you, what you're saying is if the students are on the same premises as the activity, it would, in your estimation, would be a violation. I would say I don't know the answer offhand because there's not guidance on it yet, but I would think there's going to be pretty significant risk if they're present anywhere on the premises and there's a fundraiser with alcohol going on anywhere in the premises that it could be a violation of this not section. a school activity. So let's say, hypothetically, we have an event at um, the high school, mm -hmm. okay? It's a Saturday night. It's an adult-only event. There's alcohol being served at the event. And there are some kids hanging out in the parking lot. But yeah. they're not, it's not a school activity. They weren't invited. They're not there for um, traffic or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. again, it's, it's risk management. I mean, if you've got, you know, closed doors and nobody can come in and the event is contained in one area and the students happen to be out in the parking lot, mm -hmm. I can't answer definitively, but I think the risk might be low. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're not present at the event, arguably. Right, but, but if the event is in the cafeteria and there is a student basketball game going on mm -hmm. in the gym, that would be a problem. I would, I would think so, yeah. And all kidding aside, I mean, with the seriousness of alcohol consumption in general, it's something that we have to take very seriously and think very hard about. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Google's a beautiful thing. 
<laughs> we do it <laughs> smart homes. <laughs> Okay, and then just really quickly, um, Harold touched on this earlier, the bingo games. There's a lot of regulation here. Um, it used to be that you couldn't really have them at all. Now, uh, this legislation, Penal Code 326.5, authorizes cities and counties to allow them and regulate them. Um, and as Harold mentioned, it's a crime to receive any uh, receive or pay any wage or salary to operate these bingo games. Can you also speak to, because I know it's going to come up and we might as well address it now, a 50-50 raffle. Do you know anything about that? Yeah. There's any raffle. Yeah, no, it's not any just game a of chance raffle. under the, the codes, any game of chance has elements of this built in. And there are specific rules that got laid out in the legislature mm -hmm. for bingo actually to make it easier for bingo right. than other activities. So whenever you have games of chance, the, the right answer is check with the lawyer because it's gonna depend entirely on how it's being administered, whether it's literally a game of chance, if do you have to buy to get in, or is it a suggested donation? That makes a difference um, because if you can only participate, say in a raffle, by having to buy a ticket and get in, you're now having a game of chance that people are, it's gambling, it's just legal, it's non-legalized gambling. If, if, any, if it's a door prize and everybody can get a book of 10 tickets but there's a suggested donation of $50, that's acceptable. Um, as long as it's literally being done as a donation requested and nothing's required. In that case, though, they get a ticket regardless of where they put money and their donation is, requ is requested, right? right. Exactly, and if they may want to make a smaller donation instead of the, the suggested donation, that becomes a, a more of a door prize, kind of fits in that category as opposed to I'm paying to enter into what they talk about as a game of chance or a lottery is what the law talks about. Okay, my point was that the, um, <laughs> the uh, there are laws and you know you can do raffles if you follow them, but the another high school which will remain nameless at their athletic booster event they do 50 50 raffles and those are quite clearly i mean basically the department of justice website says they're illegal i mean it just basically calls it out this is a this is a law that is really typically violated all over the state and fortunately is not frequently prosecuted but every now and then the the state decides that they want to make a point and they pick somebody and they prosecute them and then it, everybody pulls back for five or ten years. We don't want to be that exactly. person. Exactly. So these laws do apply to foundations and organizations of the like because of their affiliation with the schools? Actually these apply just because they apply to, apply to everybody, okay. to any kind of organization. Um, back, back, just trivial, trivially back many, many years ago like in Prohibition era, there used to be charitable foundations that started that were called charitable foundations that were just gambling places. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's not a far cry to say that they give 10% to the orphanage and they keep the other 90% and make profit on it. And all of these laws chase back to you know the 1950s where all of this is going on. And I'm so glad you addressed this because people look at me like I have three heads when I tell them a PTA can't do a raffle because if you're buying the tickets. Yeah, they may be they able to, but they have to, again, there's very yeah. strict parameters about uh, what you call, you shouldn't be calling it a raffle necessarily, the tickets are suggested donation, all of that, and the key always is you can't require somebody to, to pay to participate. Um, that's what separates that from Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. well, I well, and some other things. <laughs> and that actually was our last slide, so we were going to, uh, to ask you if there are any questions. I was going to let Kelly do that, but I'm up here now, so I'll do it. I, I have a couple of questions. Um, there are benefits to the PTA because they provide support, they provide knowledge, there's reporting requirements to the PTA. There's also downside. You have to pay membership dues that don't go to the district. Um, I was unable to find any such national organization for boosters. Are you aware of any? I, I'm not. Okay. PTA is the only national one I know of. Um, and then on, on page three, slide two, when we talk about the documentation, you know, the, the financial reporting, um, I, I think it would be a good idea in the annual process where you're getting the proposed fundraisers for the coming year that you also get the 
IRS, FTB, and DOJ filings for the previous year. Mm -hmm. um, I just think we should just add that to the packet. And that was present, as you'll recall, in one of the other school district examples where they did have to submit those filings annually. They've got to submit, they've got to be done anyway. And that assures you all that they've been submitted. And we have had cases where somebody let their 501c3 status lapse and the school district had no idea because the booster group had no idea. And so it's a, if they don't provide you that paperwork, they can't keep raising funds in your name. So based on that scenario right there, is there an expectation for the board to know? Is What kind of liability does the board have if, if something like that were to happen? You know, the, the question of liability on all of this is it's a good thing to pause on for a moment because the bottom line is this is still an outside organization. By definition, you don't control them. You just have, it's almost like a contract with them for them to use your name. They're going to provide you with particular information. So your, your liability is generally not increased by deciding to have more oversight. And one could even argue in some ways you may be limiting your liability because you're going to get caught up in fewer of these issues. Um, sadly, at the end of the day, if something goes awry with a booster group that was raising funds in your name, the district's name is going to be in the newspaper. If there's lawsuits filed, you're going to be named in the lawsuit, whether you have liability or not. Um, you're going to get dragged into it. And so many school districts look at that and say, well, at the point we're going to be involved with it one way or the other, and at the point it doesn't technically increase our liability, why wouldn't we want to have more oversight so we can catch those moments before they happen? On the flip side, though, um, like m more oversight, like if, and I'm not saying that we are or that we should, but if a district said, okay, in order for us to give you approval, you know, we have the right to withhold approval if we don't want to, and in order for us to give you that approval, we're going to make it so that the um, the principal of the school that's benefiting has to sign all the checks. And when you, you know, that's more control, but by the same token, now the principal, the staff of the district is now integrally involved in the operation of the entity. So to my way, to, to my way of thinking, that kind of involvement would actually increase the risk to the district because now they're, they're part of the operation of the organization, whether they like it or not. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think that once you get to that level of micromanagement, you've broken down the border that they're separate entities. And the other thing you've done now is for that employee, that employee is told by the district, presumably by policy, you must approve every one of those checks. So then the employee is also at risk. You haven't just put the district at greater risk, but that employee now, if they miss one, they're subject to potential discipline by their employer. And so that's why it's usually more of a, we, we count on those foundations to keep their own books. We count on them to have their checks and balances, but we want to see that they're doing right. it and be able to raise our hand when it looks like they're not doing it. I, oh, go ahead. No, I, I, I would just think that in all of this, though, if I can get back to a point you guys made very, very early in the conversation, which is we're kind of treating organizations disparately here as far as what we're getting and what we're not getting. And, and everything else I'm taking from this is, is at some point I do, I'm hoping this turns into a, the next step of this conversation, which is, all right, it's time to really take a hard look at this and, and you know, I, a uniformity of process, I think, as part of our overall goals is something that we should be looking to do, so. Which is um, a great, great transition to the, the question that I have is, at this point, we have organizations that are already established. If we were to modify board policy and in either direction, whatever we decide as a board to do, um, do those organizations still have to comply? They should have to because, again, it's a matter of using your name, raising funds for the school district. So at any point, that is that is something that they get at your pleasure to tell them, yes, you're allowed to use our name or not, and it's appropriate to say, here's the new process we're going to have. We'd like you to follow it. There, there have been, on occasion, over the years, I've had booster groups or foundations faced with that that say, we don't want to operate under those rules. And, and when that's happened, almost inevitably, that group disbands and a new foundation is formed by other folks that want to support the district that follow those rules. That's rare, though. More, in my experience, almost always the foundation, the booster group, whoever it is, they're happy to work with the district, especially if they understand this is not bureaucracy. You're doing this to protect them as much as you are to protect the district. Sure. I can't imagine we would have any problems if we involved them in the conversations as we were planning changes to our board policies. I had one question. Yeah. 
I do have one last question, and maybe I misunderstood your comment, um, because you in the in the opening remarks, um, you said that an organization can you know like they'll file the paperwork and then they'll start operating and they actually need to have their 501c3 status. This was actually a pretty significant issue for several of the foundations, um, because the IRS was swamped. Um, and so it took two years to get the tax determination letter from the date that the uh, IRS Form 1023 was, was mailed um, to the date that the tax determination letter was issued by the IRS was two years away. And so one of the questions, and in in my understanding based on reading the frequently asked questions on the IRS website was that once you mail your IRS 1023, that you can operate as a, as a 501c3 companies won't give you money because you're not on select check you're not you know on guide star and all the other stuff but the reality is the irs says they'll honor charitably like if they audit a a tax return they'll honor it in the gap between the time that the 1023 is mailed and the time that it's actually they get a 10 uh, tax determination letter yeah no that's a very good distinction i have in mind a situation where somebody that's that is applicable as i understand it if you have correctly filled out the form and submitted it we've had situations where they didn't correctly fill out the form waited not two years but six months only to be found to find out that they they weren't eligible so there's a it's it's almost a self-certifying if you've mailed it in you're certifying you've done it correctly and you're raising the funds that way Again, it's a good reason for the district to be interested in seeing what actually Absolutely. got submitted. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a really good point. So I donated, you know, $2,000, and I want to claim that on my taxes, and then, oops, the paperwork wasn't done right, and mm -hmm. now I don't have that ability. And by the way, if you yeah. donate more than X, you need a letter from the organization, not just a cancel check. Okay. All right. I know. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Harold, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, a lot of information. Good. Thank you both. That's very good. Thank you um, for having us. For the board, I think um, our next step should be, I think that we need to kind of, now that we've been educated, take a closer look like look at this with some of the leadership of the foundations. I, I would recommend maybe a workshop where we can sit down with the foundations, pull out our policies, and, uh, and figure out what direction we want to go. Comments? I agree. Uh, and, and involving, I... I also agree on both sides with the both of you who said involving the foundations, the boosters clubs, everybody and anybody who's an entity in this will be important because I, the last thing I would want it to be perceived at by those groups is this is a one-sided conversation, you know, you do what we say because that's not the intent mm -hmm. here. It's again to try to protect both sides of this conversation and to get input from both sides of this conversation. What I think might work great for us, you could come back and show me the paperwork nightmare that it creates for you and we can find a different way to do it. So that it, I, as long as we're involving as many of them as and all of them, we're offering for all of them and involving as many as possible, I agree. I think this is important for us to handle. Yeah. So. Same here. And I, I think it might be a good idea to form a board subcommittee, a board policy subcommittee that could start with this one and meet with the foundations and then be there to address drafts before they come to the board. I know many districts do have uh, board policy subcommittees, but not all. And to kind of piggyback on that, I think we should probably be looking at streamlining the, the uh, policies and having one overarching policy I rather than having different policies that pertain mm -hmm. to different Agreed. different organizations. So with the board's permission, um, Dr. Nicholas has a, a lunch coming up. I plan on, on attending. Maybe uh, we can uh, brainstorm with some of the foundations that are there, come up with idea, ideas, and at our me next meeting present to the board maybe a snapshot of what, a, what moving forward might look like. Would that be... Acceptable? A snapshot of the proposed policies? No, or? no. Process. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, work on the process first, and then, and from that, kind of move forward as far as Sorry. Yeah. whether we just decide if it's a committee mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get some feedback from a lot. I think a lot of the foundations are represented tonight. We can get some feedback, have a little discussion, at least bring back some of that feedback back to the full board at our next meeting, mm -hmm. and, and bring it as a discussion item, and figure out moving forward what we want to do. I think that's a great way to start because yep. they have as the, the the foundation leadership has just as much of a vested interest in doing this right as we do. Um, I will also be at that meeting as a representative of 
one of the school foundations and it, the date on that is February 18th at 12 noon, 12 to 1.30? Something like that. 12 to 1.30. Being that it's during the day, are all of the foundations able to uh, send folks? We had a fairly good turnout at the last one. I'm not sure every foundation was represented, but what we can do, we'll, we'll do some reaching out and see if, mm -hmm. if there's going to be a foundation that's not represented, then we'll come up with a different thing. Mm -hmm. We'll make sure everyone's represented somehow. Okay, anything further? Uh, next item is calendar. Monday, January 26th is a facility use committee meeting at 6.30. That's Monday, uh, this coming Monday. And then uh, Wednesday, February 4th is our next regular meeting at 7 p.m. I move we adjourn to closed session. I'll second. Good to see you, Harold. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Meeting adjourned.